I was an average American suburban girl. I took a job at an Arabic restaurant in Pittsburgh when I was a college student. Unbeknownst to me, that experience would change the rest of my life and my career trajectory. I ended up living in Lebanon for five years. working on a number of new media projects devoted to human rights and international humanitarian law. an anthropologist, an activist, a journalist, and a writer. My name is Laurie King. My introduction into the history and the politics didn't come from, you know, going to a rally, but from human interaction. And when you want to try to reach the American public or try to talk to American journalists and explain to them what is happening in the Arab world, it's really hard because people just implicitly, without knowing it, already have this unquestioned idea that somehow the Israelis are good and the Palestinians are bad because they don't know Palestinians and they don't know people's personal stories. So as far as whatever I've done as a journalist or activist, I think I've always tried to bring it back to, you know, okay, these are real people, and this is what their life is like, and this are, these are the sorts of challenges that they have to grapple with. And I think it's better to try to reach people with these human stories than it is to get up and start saying, you know, Zionism is evil. You said that to Americans, and they just you know, that's it. They don't want to hear anything you have to say. They just walk away. So then the question becomes, how do you encourage people to ask questions um, and to see things from a new angle? Not by yelling at them and shouting all kinds of, you know, political rhetoric, but just saying, these are human beings. In August of 2000, Nigel Perry called me one day and he said, you know, we really have to create a satire website and it will be all about Palestine. So we had everything planned out. We were writing funny satirical stories. And then September, Second Intifada happens. And immediately all of us could see that the way the Western media was reporting it was just so unlike what we knew the stories were from friends that we were in email contact with. So we were emailing back and forth, and then Nigel said, we need to have a website that explains all the myths and you know, questions all the media portrayals, and now we have email. We're in touch with journalists and activists and you know, documentary filmmakers, photographers, university professors in the West Bank and Gaza, so they can be like um, stringers and reporters, and we can do a website that lets their voices come into the mainstream media discourse online in English and get journalists to look at that. And so that sounds like a good idea. So we just kind of started to work on it bit by bit, and then he decided we should call it Electronic Intifada. And so then we got other people involved, and then Ali Abu Nami already had his website. So we first thought that the website should be a media monitoring site. And it, you know, it picked up a lot of steam and people liked it and paid attention to it really pretty quickly. And I think that around the time of uh, September 11th, 2001, which was about nine months after we launched the Electronic Intifada, of course everything changed, the way the media was portraying the entire Arab Islamic world and, you know, Palestine in particular became very difficult. So we thought, well, 
You can encourage people to write critical letters to the media all that you want, but the media has a discourse, it has a narrative, it's staying with it despite the facts. So Aryan al fasad the Dutch-Palestinian member of the team, he said, well, if you can't critique the media and have an impact, he said, then we just have to be the media that we want to see. So we changed the focus of it. So instead of critiquing the media and getting people to be a watchdog, on, you know, especially the American, the British, the Canadian press, we thought, okay, we'll start you know, having people be journalists, like citizen journalists from on the ground. So the focus and the purpose and the mission of Electronic Intifada started to change a bit from media monitoring to like a new different kind of media, like an alternative narrative. <laughs>
the interview with the people on the committee, one of the gentlemen there asked me, he said, well, we see that you've been rather active in engaged journalism on the issue of Palestine. If you were to be on the faculty here, would you continue doing that? And I said, well, probably. And I found it sad that people have these limiting visions of what you can discuss in an academic setting. Um, so in that case, no, I didn't get that job. But I found it odd because let's say that I was an activist who was very involved in the situation in Burma. Nobody would complain, but if you're talking about Palestinian human rights, then suddenly you're in a different category. So I was teaching by day and then staying up until, you know, all hours of the night working on the website. And it was also about that time that the case in Belgium, uh, the Sabra and Shatila massacre survivors case in Belgium began to take shape. And some of the lawyers working on it and some of the people collecting testimonies from the massacre survivors thought that because I had worked in journalism and I knew Arabic and English and that I could write pretty well and pretty fast so they should put me in charge of the media side of it. In the past there had been, you know, investigative reports in various attempts to have some kind of non-legal or non-judicial um, tribunal about what happened. But this was the first time that an actual concerted formal legal case was really put together. The first stage was that first it had to be accepted as a valid case. That stage was passed. And then a stage came where the court had to decide whether to go forward from the investigative stage to the next stage where you're going to have an actual case. And one court says, no, we can't do this because Sharon is not present on Belgian soil. So the case against Sharon and the other Israelis and Lebanese was almost to the point of being thrown out at one point and then the lawyers took it to a higher court. Everybody fully expected that the Supreme Court would stop everything. But the Supreme Court of Belgium decided that even though Ariel Sharon and the other Israelis and Lebanese were not presently on Belgian soil, that they could indeed be considered prosecutable. Um, with the exception, they said, Ariel Sharon as a sitting head of government would enjoy temporary immunity as long as he was a sitting head of government, but the case could move forward against the others. They started to get emails to the email account through the website that, you know, said such things as, those who fish in dark waters will drown, and those who um, stir up ghosts will become a ghost themselves and so some of it was kind of creepy and it was the first time that I got email communications like that that I really did get a little bit nervous about. Some Belgian parliamentarians who were from the Green Party and the leftist parties who were sympathetic to the use of the Belgian courts to pursue international crimes. They had come to Beirut to do a little bit of fact-finding and they did have a meeting with Elias Holbeka and he apparently told them that he was ready to go to Belgium and clear his name. And then, you know, within a month, he was assassinated. In June of 2003, Donald Rumsfeld, the former Secretary of Defense, was in Belgium and he was giving a public speech and he basically said that if the Belgian government continued to prosecute war crimes that might have been committed anywhere by anybody, that the United States would see to it that NATO would be moved from Brussels. So a lot of pressure came onto the Belgian government to try to reverse the law. And so by the end of the summer, indeed, the new Belgian parliament, one of the first things they did was to basically take apart the legislation that enabled 
the use of Belgian courts for international legal criminal prosecution for international crimes. I felt, um, you know, crushed, not just for the fact that I had put time into this, but I felt badly that the uh, survivors, the people in the camps who had given testimony, who had, you know, started to maybe think that, oh, maybe this time it's not going to be just uh, media exercise, but something's going to happen. And when they were really failed, I mean, it, at some level I felt that we had failed them again, that by going through this whole process and almost coming to the point of having a legal case go forward in a major European court and then having it not happen, I felt that we had disappointed the people who had survived this massacre. So I felt, you know, I'd say I felt sort of almost guilty in a way, or like I had been partly maybe responsible for getting their hopes up for nothing. Ideally, what should happen is that crime should be prosecuted where they took place. the Six Day War happened and it was right at the end of the school year and I remember we were getting ready to go to school and my mother was up watching television, watching the news in the morning which, you know, wasn't something that normal to be watching the news early in the morning and she was saying, oh, there was a war and, you know, we were watching images on TV of Palestinians leaving and crossing the bridge that was damaged and that really stuck in my head and I remember there was one scene where there were two little boys just standing in the road and everything was dusty and they were about my age and they were just standing there looking really lost and confused and that just really stayed with me that little image but then I didn't really think about the politics of the Middle East or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict really anything again until I was much older In Washington, if you're a woman and you have an MA, you will watch men with BAs go past you and where you have to, you know, get all the degrees you can because otherwise you'll be treated like a little girl or a secretary. So I got back into the PhD program and got a Fulbright grant to go off and do my field research in Nazareth about Palestinian citizens of Israel and their political identity. I really had such a, a lovely time there and I really, really loved the people in Nazareth and I felt like in some way, like one guy there said that he said I was sort of on the same, somehow the same emotional or personality wavelength, but of all the places I've ever been in my life, I think I felt the most at home there. Kind of like I had known the situation and the people almost like forever. I started working as a waitress at a Syrian restaurant in Pittsburgh when I was in college. So that's how the interest in the Middle East and the Arab world started, was in a restaurant. I really liked Arabic food and I came to really like Arabic music. And the owner of the restaurant, very nice guy, he was a little bit, you know, Mijnoun Shwe, Min Humps. I'm a little olive oil. You can't have enough of it. I'm a little Palestinian. Where are you? The zaytun, I'm him. 
So, you know, just little things like that. You, you see as an anthropologist, you see that certain symbols and images come up again and again, that they have different meanings or common meanings in different contexts. And, yeah, you know, it really makes you think about things differently. Like one woman I interviewed, she was from Ramola. She was married to a guy from Nazareth, but she was from Ramola. And she would come and bring back olives and olive oil from there. And she'd bring it to me. She goes, Lori, the olives and the olive oil from my father's land, it's the best. Everything else, it's okay, but this is the best. So she would make sure I had her olive oil, all right, not just any olive oil. And then she told me her father had to sell the land, and he was so sad. And um, she said, well, you know, he's so sad. I mean, the... The, some of the olive trees, they're, they're so young. They're, they're too young to be let go yet. They're, they're still children. And I was just like, wow, you know, considering trees like they're people and children. So it wasn't like, oh, this is some productive capital I have. And you know, it's like, you know, um, loss, gain kind of consideration of an economic nature I'm going to make. But it was like, no, you know, he can't sell the land because he just planted the trees. And the olives are too young. Oh, haram. And the masakin, they're so small, they're little, he can't let them go yet. So just little things like that that make you look at the situation in a new way. I just, you know, find stuff like that fascinating. Okay, now for Here in Washington, I mean, if you are an anthropologist and you know anything about the Middle East, you will have all kinds of defense contractors wanting to hire you. And we see that now a lot in the United States today where the government or the military would like to use anthropologists to help understand what's going on in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan um, and use anthropological knowledge in that way and that creates a big debate within the anthropological community. I mean, to me that just seemed so clearly unethical and problematic. I just, you know. I just couldn't see myself doing it, you know. For me, the idea would be if I ever went back to Nazareth, Nasra, or back to Beirut, and people said, oh, how are you? What are you doing these days? I wouldn't even be able to say. I would feel somehow like I was doing something not just against my own sense of what's right, but that somehow I would be doing something against them. Not as Arabs or as Muslims, but just as, you know, human beings I know. And I know their life story. And to be doing something where I'd be using my skills and my perspectives and education to forward or advance situations that somehow are not good for them, nor are they good for Americans or American soldiers, that I just would find it too, too troubling. You know, I just, I really, no. It is axiomatic that power corrupts, but powerlessness corrupts even more. Knowledge is not truly power unless it is shared. Blocking or deforming knowledge is one of the cruelest ways to rob people of their power and humanity. New media enables everyone in the world to know and act upon human rights abuses. Anthropology should be melded with journalism and activism to counteract racism the primary cause of powerlessness, injustice, and despair in the world today.